sociopathic stores as a primer. Um, it turns out that they occupy positions of power and authority because if you don't have to. to play by the rules, yeah. then it's easier to win. Where they don't show up now statistically are in places like prison, where where those are people who were born into a bad situation. Those are the people who, you know, this era where being called privileged is a pejorative term. Um, those are the people who were not born into privilege. David Cullum, how are you? I'm good. And as you know, a little late, but good. It's uh, it's not a problem on my end. I'm just really thrilled to have you. I was going to tell you, and a uh, shout out to Bob Moriarty. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that punk. Crotchety old fart. <laughs> he um, he um, was very, uh, I've interviewed him a half a dozen times, and he has um, become a friend of mine. And the guy is hilarious, actually. He has some good in very, very, good. very funny. Yeah, he's had some great insights and uh, I've known Bob and I think he, you have a history with him too, but I sent mm -hmm. stuff to him with the previous business I had. This was, you know, nearly 20 years ago and he put it up and I get all this traffic and I, and, uh, so I reached out to him, I don't know, six, eight months ago, nine months ago. And he said, yeah, let's do an interview, Andy. Okay. Right. Bob, Bob actually published the first thing I ever wrote sort of in earnest on the internet under a pseudonym. Bob published it. What was the pseudonym? Uh, my son's name. When I used to, I was going to chat boards in the late nineties that were a combination of things, but fair market chat boards. So guys like Slack and stuff were wandering these things, trying to tell the world that the dot-com bubble was a problem. I, I had spotted the problem around. June 1st of 20, uh, of 1998. And I liquidated half of my mutual funds. And then we went right to the Asian crisis. And I'm sitting there going, you're either a moron or a genius because, because, because you left half in harm's way. But, but most people, they got half out of the way, we consider that a massive win. You know, that's the dry powder model, but I said, yeah. if, it, if it comes back, I'm dumping the rest. And by mid 99, I was absolutely equity free. And, uh, for you, that was great timing. Yeah, I, I did everything right until the teens, and then I and then I kind of rode the sidelines and, and, yeah. uh, because I didn't believe they could retrieve it the way they did. Yeah, I want to work that out too. Like about Flack, I uh, I was a huge fan in the uh, late late nineties. Um, okay, yeah, you must have been like in sixth grade then. <laughs> I was fresh out of college. Okay. And uh, a funny story about that. I was aggressively shorting, which was not a good idea. And uh, I actually was shorting too. And that's a sign something's wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. I learned my lesson because, uh, and I was shorting through options. And I had a, I had a lot of put options on the NASDAQ. And what year? Uh, what year? 99? It, I started in, uh, Average in 99 and they expired in March 2000, which was. <laughs> Good <laughs> timing. Good timing, was, young man. That was, that was really exactly, great. I love your love because that was Good exactly timing. it. Because I knew it, but I didn't know it, meaning that my timing was like that. And I just. Well, you know, they say it too early is wrong. Well, well I, I disagree wrong. with yeah. that. I disagree with that. That's the. That is if you're a fruit fly and, and it's a mating dance, then fine. But um, yeah, I wrote about the collapse of the banking system in May 6th of 2002. And, and you say, well, you know, it's five years later. And I said, but if you read what I wrote, I mean, I called the complete collapse of the banking system. Yeah. If you make a call like that, five years is a blink of an eye. Yeah. Yeah. So. Well, it's funny you say that too, because... I was in the market. I actually got out of the market. So here's my redemption. I was trading for a hedge fund in 2007. And we Ooh, went. What hedge it. fund? What hedge fund? It was a really small hedge fund. It only had, okay. and this sounds impressive to some listeners, but it's not. It only had about 20 million in assets. In no, that does, that's not a big hedge fund, right? No, no, no. no. But, but I mean, uh, we went to cash in 2007. Mm -hmm. And I had one investor, one wealthy investor. 
And uh, so I saved him a lot of money. And then we went, started buying again in um, 2009. So again, that's my redemption. So my <laughs> mistake was in 2009, I started buying ever so daintily. I'd made a lot of money on tobacco. The best, the best purchase I ever made in terms of, I don't judge it based on the outcome. One time I did a hedge eye interview with Keith, what's his name, McCullough. Yeah. And I said, I said, I really made the call correct unless you consider performance to be a metric. Um, and, yeah. but, but I really do <laughs> think it's the, it's the reasoning that's correct, right. And, the, and tobacco was hated, had P's of six, dividend yeah. yields of 12%. And I'm going, what am I missing? They're not going to, they, they were facing 142 billion dollar lawsuit. And, and, um, and, and I go, but they can't go bankrupt because then the states won't get paid. So they, they're going to survive. And, um, yeah. and, and selling to junkies is always profitable. And, <laughs> and so I bought a ton of tobacco right before the decision came down that they lost it. But what triggered my willingness to buy was about a three paragraph article that said, if they lose the lawsuit, they'll have to raise cigarettes, 50 cents a pack and pay it off over 20 years. So I go, oh my God, it's a, right. it's a, fi it's a fi 50 cents a pack tax. That's all it is. Yeah. And yeah. so I bought a bunch and put you know, kids to college on that trade alone. And I still own it. I mean, I, yeah. I never sold. So I was yeah. buying tobacco in 09. I had a short fund with David Tice. It wasn't his anymore. It was, you know, federated I mean, investors. I remember David Tice. I, I chatted with him yesterday just to tell you how small this world is. Um, but I, I shorted from like Oh five to Oh nine. And, and I emptied that short position. Um, I, I did the math on this actually in about four aliquots, but the average Dow was around 6,800. Yeah. Now I had people saying, hang on, hang on. There's more to go. And I sort of agreed, but I said, but I, now I'm going to the cabana and drinking daiquiris and watching you guys surf the waves. Cause I, I'm <laughs> And it was really a market neutral light because I had other things at risk at the time. And, and, um, and, uh, but then I only bought, I bought some tobacco and stuff, but I was convinced there was another 50% left in the system down. Uh -huh. And then what I didn't see coming, no one saw coming was $30 trillion of bailout. Yeah. So that's just kind of the story. That's been the story. Not so much tobacco, but been really the story of the last 15, 16 years. It's just mm -hmm. bailout after bailout. Just do, doesn't make sense. Just, you know. just, but it's, it's like a, it's like a, a, it's like an avalanche where it's just piling up snow higher and higher and higher. And any, I, I'm a chemist. So any, yeah. any chemist will tell you when you get displaced far from equilibrium, whether we're talking earthquakes where in California, there hasn't been a big one in a long time. The stresses are building up or avalanches, snow's building up or markets, you know, overvaluations building up, you name it. Um, the return trip when it finally it's, goes back to equilibrium, when yeah. it finally wipes out the, all that excess and blows out all that potential energy and turns into kinetic energy is fast and destructive. Yeah. Now, the Fed has prevented the, the long-term destructiveness of it but to do so, they've just created more bubbles. And so they're, they're, they just keep, I hate trite phrases. Um, I like to invite, invent my own if I can, but, but the, the can kicking metaphor, they just keep doing it. And, yeah. and so I think this next one's going to be a painful one. And I don't think it's going to be a V bounce. I don't think it's going to be one of these 50% down and then two years of 50% up and then we're back safe. I think it's going to be a Nikkei like thing. Okay, so let's work that out. And I'm very interested in that because there's so much going on, but I do think we're at the precipice, if you would. Mm -hmm. But it's like, it's like they can print so much money. And that money has to, and I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to work this out. You're trying to think, you're trying to, you're already steel manning it a little bit. Just to right. see if you can make sense of it, right? Yeah, I mean, that, and that's what we've seen. I mean, why can't that go on forever, if you would? And then inflation, 
Well, that's what we have right now, right? And so... Right, right but it's finally shown up. So now it's gotten into the DNA. It's like the vaccine. It's gotten into the DNA. And, and, and so now, um, now uh, inflation expectations, the Fed always talked about inflation expectations, but people didn't understand what that meant. Uh, one Fed governor once said, since the expectations are low, there can't be inflation. I'm going, well, you're actually a moron. Um, and, but inflation expectations, the problem is because when you start planning for the rises, then they become endemic. So when you, 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 you program price hikes into your economic model, when you program price hikes into contracts that you sign with unions, when you, th then, then the prices hikes become unavoidable. And when, you know, restaurants stop printing out menus and they just, you know, they, they have some digital mechanism to up it every day. Um, yeah. You know, then the price, and, and by the way, inflation is not 3%. I, I don't care who you are. I don't care how many degrees in economics you have. Inflation is not 3%. Yeah. So in any event, um, so inflation expectations, inflation is very real. You know, I wouldn't be shocked if it was 10. There's an interesting yeah. implication, by the way. If inflation has been running, you know, the Chapwood Index? No, go ahead. I mean, this me. has been bugging me. The Chapwood Index is kind of like a shadow stats inflation index. Shadow okay. stats has been demonized by everyone who wants to pretend inflation's okay. You know, the John, uh, what's his John Williams? I think John Williams, shadows. by the way, let me interrupt you. I had him on it two weeks ago, three weeks yeah. ago. What do yeah. you think inflation is? What's he put it at? He said, take what the printed inflation is. I'm, I'm going from memory here and add 8% eight, 8 to that. That's, That's about right. That's that, that. Now, now here's one of the problems with it. So, so Chapwood does the same thing. Chapwood takes something like the top 50 cities in the country and monitors 500 prices and doesn't have hedonic adjustments and stupid things like that, that Bosk and shove down our throats. And, uh, and just says how much of the price has gone up and on the sort of a per unit, you know, per pound of Fritos, per pound of per gallon of milk per right. And, um, and, and they have inflation running. They've had it running double digit. Now, I have a little bit of an issue with both to the extent that if, you, if it's really as inflationary as they both say, going back as many years, if you back calculate where the prices had to have been you know, 20 years ago, you end up at prices that seem too low. Now, if instead of being inflation running at 10%, it's running at nine, it's amazing what a compounding difference you get. And so, so it could be just a slight error in their estimate that's causing that. Um, but, but here's the interesting thing. Well, first of all, let me hammer the Boskin guy since I picked a fight with him. Boskin Commission decided that you have to adjust for various things. One of the funniest is when they count for inflation, they, what's it called? Owner equivalent rent? Is that what yeah. they call it? Yeah. yeah, I have trouble remembering all those acronyms. They estimate the cost of housing by asking you how much you could rent your house for. Literally a survey of clowns. You have to be Melody Wright, who you should interview, by the way. You have to be Melody Wright or an expert in real estate to answer that question. Now, what they could be doing is saying, look, this is like asking the audience to want to be a millionaire. They're saying, look, if we ask 10,000 people, even though they're all clueless, they'll still get the answer right. The bell curve will center on the right place. I don't believe that. I think it's stupid. Um, you could, for example, monitor housing costs by getting Uber to give you the, uh, by giving uh, Airbnb to give you the numbers, right? There, there's better ways to do it. Right. But, but they, they do a survey, which therefore is moronic. And we use moronic a lot today, as my guess. Um, they also have to think of substitution and they have hedonic adjustments where they say, look, your blender has more buttons on it. Therefore, it's actually cheaper than you think. And what they ignore is that your blender is also going to last 10 percent of the time of the original blenders that we all had when we were kids. They last until we're adult unless you drop them on the floor and smash them like I did. Um, and so there's a hidden inflation that they don't count, which is accelerated depreciation. Now, we have okay. a two-year-old fridge in the Adirondacks. We had a fridge in the Adirondacks we replaced from 1939. It still ran. We replaced with a new one. There were certain reasons for it. It already appears to be broken after two years. That's yes. inflation. That's inflation. That's a factor of 20 inflation correction yeah. right there. So that I obsess over that. And I don't see any economist accounting for that.
Maybe they do. If someone's listening and they know they do, send me a link because I want to know about it because I think the economists ignore that. Everything we buy is crap and going to crap very quickly. Yeah. And that is hidden. We know it, but yeah. the inflation metrics don't. Yeah. The other thing is they do, um, so they just hedonic adjustment. They pretend like something's better because you've got intermittent windshield wipers. Okay, fine. The newest cars have these, you know, keyless keyless shit in the car, and I'm sure they're adjusting the shit out of that. I hate the keyless cars. I have one, and I, I hate it. I want to be able to make a copy of the key. I want to be able to turn the car on with a key. I, I don't want a keyless fob, um, it, but they'll give it huge credit. Um, now, the other thing they do is they do substitution. They say, look, if you're eating prime rib and the price goes up and you can substitute with chicken. <laughs> and, and, and so you say, therefore, the cost of living is not going up as fast as, as right. if you just monitor the prices. But here's the problem. The free market, let's say prime rib is twice as much. The free market is setting the value of prime rib at twice that of chicken. Therefore, you should hedonically adjust the downgrade in the quality of your chicken by a factor of two. So hedonically, you should adjust precisely for the, for the substitution, which they like to use. The substitution should not exist as a, an inflation correction. They don't care because they're morons. Yeah. Now. The other thing is they quote inflation numbers at 3%. I'm sorry, I'm on a roll here, but they, infl they cite inflation numbers at 3 3.5%. We all know that our own personal inflation somehow don't look like that. No. You go into the store, you, you buy, I bought a drink and a bigger than, the, you know, it's sort of like a, one of those bags of chips or something that's too much to eat in one sitting, but, but not a big, huge monster bag. It was like $11. Yeah, I asked Jimmy Iorio, a good friend of mine, owns a restaurant. He can tell you exactly what the inputs are doing. I go down to the local diner. They can tell me exactly what the inputs are doing. Um, so we don't believe the numbers. Rosie Rosenberg, David Rosenberg, explained part of the problem the other day, which really should be a headline explanation, and economists should all do this. That is, he said there's... There's several kinds of inflation. He says there's sticky inflation. Those are the things that are going to go up no matter what is happening to the economy. Best example I can think of is postage. The, the price of stamps yeah. will never go down, right? right? And there's other things like that that won't go down. And he says, although that influences your life, it has no economic content in it. Because if you monitor that price, it's not telling you where the economy is accelerating or slowing. What you want to do is monitor the things where if it's accelerating, the price goes up. And if it's the economy slowing, the price goes down. And, that, and I, think, I think, therefore, these 3.5% inflation numbers they're using are probably the things that can go up or down, meaning the things that can actually deflate, too. Right. Yep. And right. therefore... I'm okay with that. Yeah. But these assholes with their PhDs in economics should explain that. If, yes. if I'm right, and, and Rosie sort of said it, but if it's generally true, you economists got to open your mouths and start talking about why your 3.5% number does not mean you are a stupid bastard. It means you are doing a different measurement. Right. Yeah. And then we can all... No, or then we all, I guess, we can make decisions based on that. You know what I'm saying? Well, we can understand why when he says three and a half percent, that's like saying an airplane costs X dollars. I go, which airplane? Right, right. right. Yeah. Let's talk about, um, you had a great call you mentioned in 2002 about the banking system. And then a funny, not a funny story, a terrifying story about that. I was, again, we went to cash in 2007 and in 2008, um, I thought I was going to have to live out in the woods and carry water, and, you know, fish for a living. Um, it really did seize up. And like you, I was very surprised that, that we recovered. And I use that recovery in loosely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're, we're intubated on life support, right? Yeah. So my question to you is, where are we now in the banking sector? Because that's only... That's only, it hasn't gone away. The problem hasn't gone away. 
So oh, where am uh, I? I unfortunately am, have have told many people over the last couple of years, if you understand the world, stop reading about economics and start reading about the rise of authoritarianism. Good answer. And it turns out that if you read people like uh, Eric Hoffer's The True Believer, I'm giving you the books I really like. Eric Hoffer's The True Believer, real simple book. The hundred, the 800 page book I'm reading right now, which I procrastinated on, and I have to send an email apologizing to the author for procrastinating because he sent it to me and I didn't read it. It's called 180 by a guy named Fergus O'Connor. Um, Fergus O'Connor uh, Greenwood. And, and it's basically the encyclopedia of everything is fucked up. And, and he, he basically sets out to say, here are all the topics you've been lied to, and here's actually what happened. And, and the stuff that I know about, he's spot on. Sure. There are some tricky parts in the book where he, t- he, he I'm having this epiphany and this is going to get into dangerous territory. I'm going to try to avoid dangerous territory, but you know, that I'm simultaneously reading a bunch of books. One is by a woman named Diana West who talks about how many communists really had infiltrated the U S government in the thirties and forties. FDR's right-hand man, the guy who sat next to FDR late at night talking about what happened that day and what would they would do the next day is a guy named Hopkins. He was full-blown Soviet spy. And, and they, were, they were all over the place, it turns out. And if you read Michael Malice's The White Pill, he talks about rising Leninism and Stalinism and the, the, the total slaughter that went on. The beauty of Malice's book is that he's a good writer and you don't get swallowed in Russianness. So you can imagine by the end, your brain just scrambled with skis hanging off the end, you know, and you're out over your skis like never before. Never thought about that. Um, and he doesn't let the Russianness get in the way of the message. And so you don't have to be a Russian expert to, to, to stay with the book. Um, so Diana West talks about all the commies in the U S government and how well known it was and how, and, and she talks about how the media coverage for him. Malice talks about the same thing and how they, they name names of media, famous journalists who said, you know, life under Stalin, sunshines and Skittles, rainbows and stuff like that, when it wasn't. And the question is why? Um, Fergus talks about how communism was all part of the global central banker plan that they benefited. And so this is like red team, blue team stuff. And they benefited from both. And the, where it gets complicated is he, is he tracks, and this is just part of the book. Fergus talks about everything, 9-11, you name it. He's going to hit COVID. I'm going to get the right. book. Yeah, it's, it's real, and it's a riveting read. I'm on page 350 and no page has slowed down. What's the name and again? It's called 180. 180. Fergus. And it's Fergus. written in numbers 180. Fergus uh, O'Connor um, uh, 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 Green, Greenwood. Shout out to Fergus. And, uh, it's, it, somehow there's a famous guy named Fergus O'Connor. So I'm, I, I get a little lost as to maybe Fergus is hiding behind a pseudonym or something. Um, I get quoted twice in it. So he hit, the, he hit my heart. <laughs> um, but an 800 page is pretty much we all got to get quoted. But he's great with quotes. And I'm stunned by the number of quotes I know and the number of quotes I don't know in the book. And, the, and I, I, if I was using a highlighter, every page would be yellow. I mean, it's just really, it's an amazing book. Where it gets complicated is it's a kind of a missing puzzle piece where you realize that and, and uh, again, West in her book talks about why we handed over Eastern Europe to the Soviets and, and all these things that just don't make sense. And um, Birgis talks about the central bankers basically saying, look, this is the world they wanted. He connects, he connects Marx through marriage to a woman with a hyphenated name. And I can't remember something hyphen Cohen with uh one of the major Rothschilds who also was married to a something hyphen Cohen woman 
Those two women have to know each other. Okay. And he talks about how actually, um, um, what's the name of Bob, Bob, uh, old man, it, non-plastic brain now, um, of Marx's book. Um, Hegel? Uh, Hegel? No, no, not Hegel. Mar Marx wrote the most famous book on economics. Um, in any event, he says Marx's famous book on economics, which I'm drawing a blank on. I, I keep doing this one too. Um, had been banging around for about 70 years and they just basically gave it to Marx and he polished it up and then published it. <laughs> and, 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 and so the problem is, is it appears as though communism was part of the system. And if you look what's going on in the modern world today, you go, we appear to be doing that again, or appear to be right. doing it. They're pretty big excited. The great reset, all this stuff. You go, why is this happening? Why are we going here? You know, the, the woke is neo, neo Marxism. Um, you know, the, the, the socialism, the every, everything's gone to hell in a handbasket. And Sergis makes a very good case that this is just, just the banking system's way of scraping assets. Every time you, every time you go to, you know, socialism, the people don't get the money. They go broke. And the, the capital that existed is still there. The, the, the land, the factories, although they tend to go to shit, um, and so it's like this, these boom bust cycles are constant, you know, pump money into the system. And then, and then when the bust comes, who gets the collateral at the bust? Commercial real estate market's collapsing right now. And I mean, it's really a mess now and it's just warming up. Who's going to get those buildings? The big banks. Yeah, probably. Now, where it gets complicated is, is that you end up in uh, the sort of the, the land of anti-Semitism. Where right. people say, well, if you're picking on Rothschild, that means you're an anti-Semite. If you're picking on George Soros, that means you're an anti-Semite. Rothschild would happen to be the richest guy in the world. His family is the richest family in the world. They happen to dominate the global banking scene. So if we can't talk about Rothschild without being called an anti-Semite, then, then from me, you get the big fuck you, right? And, and, but it's, it has scared me, though. But I realize now, last year, I, I had put a gag order on the Gaza-Israel battle on myself. I, I don't talk about Israel. I, don't, I said, I'm not talking about it. I said to my class, the world has changed. I said, there's people in this room who are going to be on both sides. I guarantee you there's people sitting in this room. I said, I said, what I will tell you is be kind to each other. And that turns out to be harder to do than, than some people would have thought. Um, I won't condemn either side for what they're doing, what's happening, although it's getting pretty hard, you know, because people say, well, there's a Holocaust going on in Gaza. I'd say Israel losing the optics war. I don't know what it's like to be Israel sitting out there, but I do know that, um, I do know that if you go, if, if sitting on a university campus, you go against the Palestinian movement, you're in trouble. Yeah. If you're sitting on a university campus and you go against Israel, you're in trouble. So if you're sitting on a university campus and you open your goddamn mouth on the topic, you're in trouble. Right. You can't even and this, talk. And, and, and so I'm now 69 years old. I couldn't retire today if I wanted to. By the time they drive me off this campus because I just said the Rothschilds run the world, I'd retire anyways. It'll take that long. So um, now, again, in my opinion, it's not anti-Semitism, but the best defense in, to support Israel is to call everything anti-Semitism. And so you get pounded by that. It, it, and so now I'm laboring over it, but the, the message that comes from all these different books is that the bankers who have, you know, back in antiquity, you know, lending money for profit was considered dirty. And so they said, well, let's make the Jews do it. And to their credit, the Jews go, okay. Right. We're up with that. Right. I mean, right. how dumb do you have to be to turn down that gig? Right. And, um, and, and so there's been a sort of a compounding of wealth and stuff. And so I, someone's got to run the world. It might be, you know, the Ashkenazi Jews, every study of, uh, of intellect, real, every attempt to measure IQ keeps coming back to the, the Ashkenazi tribe of, of, of the Jewish group. They got all the Nobel prizes. They got everything. And, and if I'm just, I just can see, I said, I think those are the smart guys. Now there's theories as to why, 
why would that happen? You know, if there was a Darwinian selection pressure says, if you're not smart, you can't do banking and stuff like that, you're going to die. I, I, I just don't know. But I, I'm willing to concede. I personally would not want to intellectually compete against either Weinstein brother. You know, I mean, they're both smart as shit. I've talked to both of them. You know, they're yeah. smart. Um, I have found that when you say to, and I try to, I, I try, I intentionally try to use the word Jew. And I'll tell you why, because it's a legitimate word. Right. If you listen to a Gentile who's got their underwear stuck up their ass, I must admit that I understand this. They say Jewish people. Right. Right. They don't say Jew. And the, yep. I think the reason is because Jew sounds like Juden, sounds like Nazi German, right? There's some sort of, uh, there's something about Jews say Jews, but Gentiles are uncomfortable with it. It's they are. because they've heard it used pejoratively too many times. Yeah. I so I try to use it. I'm, I'm trying to actually acclimate to it because I, I can feel it. I mean, I, I, yeah. I can feel it. And so, um, so in any event, um, I have found, I've gotten the sense that if you say, you know, Jews are smarter on average, which I believe the attempts to show that scientifically have held up, um, there are Jews who don't like that. And my thought on that is, is because, um, because every time someone says they're different, bad things happen. Sure. I, yeah. I'd say, yeah. You, you know, you want to be, you know, fly in the wall. Yeah. After various Holocausts, I've asked colleagues, I said, what? What's the origin of anti-Semitism? I read Hannah Arendt, which which is not on my top reading list because it's hard. Yeah. I talked to one of my colleagues who's got a Nobel Prize in chemistry and lived in an attic for two years in Germany. So this guy's walk the walk, yeah. talk the talk, and he says Hannah Arendt's tough reading. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but but the various books, you know, Matthias Desmet's. Rise of uh, uh, Psychology of Totalitarianism is really good. Mm -hmm. I'm reading books on neuropsychology get there. Um, I'm reading a book now called None Dare Call It a Conspiracy from something like 1975. I read that. Larry Abrahams. That's a Jew name, uh, right? right. <laughs> yeah. And, and I read that. I'm trying to think if, if that's it. Um, let me just check something here. Um, and... The problem is these books get very, actually, I, I zoomed on Gary Allen. It is Gary Allen and Larry Abraham. Gary um, Allen, that's right. Um, it's been 30 years since I've heard that, that name. But the books, who try, the books that try to lay out this, this Rothschild relationship, Soros relationship, uh, uh, large mega bank relationship, um, either get get precariously close to sounding anti-Semitic or actually get anti-Semitic. Yeah. And, and, but, 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 but Fergus says, look, he take he has this metaphor where he says, you take this block and up here you have, you know, maybe Jews and Gentiles. He says, everyone makes the slice between the two of them. He says, you're the slicing the wrong direction. He says, here are good people on the left and sociopaths on the right. And it slices through both groups. Right. Yeah. And he That's reminds us that it, it is not, it's not the Jews, it's, not, it's the sociopaths of the world who are causing trouble. It yeah. doesn't matter which faith they have. Right. And if they happen to be in positions of power, then you got problems. George Soros has got to be a psychopath. Yeah. And he talks about this. And if yeah. you think God being anti-Semitic calling George Soros a psychopath, get a life because he is a psychopath and just because he's Jewish doesn't make him not a psychopath. Yeah. And so, and, and I'm, I'm right now, I've been stewing on this for the last couple of days immersed yeah. in it. So I'm destroying your podcast. I get kicked off no. the internet for talking this <laughs> no, way, no, but, no, no. but it's, I've been trying to understand this world and it's a complicated world. It is. And that's the thing I think really it's a complicated world, but it's interesting to get your perspective and other people's perspective. And also to take a deep dive into it, I, I, um, and that's what I've been trying to do. I, I just want to take a deep dive in that. And I think you said something really key. Is it had to happen? The blind nut does find the squirrel. Yeah, right. Well, you said something key. Is like 
it's it's really almost orchestrated, or you you can even say it's orchestrated because who gets yeah, the it's money? Totally orchestrated. Who gets the money, right? And yeah, not- and 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 then the question on what got me sort of in this direction also is the fact that I see people doing things that make no sense. Yeah. So Joe Biden opening the southern border. Exactly. I don't think Why? he's a moron. Yeah. Well, I think he is a moron. I think he is and a moron. But- and I also think he's a sociopath. I mean, yeah. one in one in twenty five, one in twenty five people statistically are considered to be clinical sociopaths. Yeah, there you like, go. He's twenty five. If you read one. books on this, sociopathic stores are a primer. Um, it turns out that they occupy positions of power and authority because if you don't they have to. to play by the rules, yeah. then it's easier to win. Where they don't show up now statistically are in places like prison, where where those are people who were born into a bad situation. Those are the people who, you know, this era where being called privileged is a pejorative term. Um, those are the people who were not born into privilege. Yeah. And so they're not there because they're sociopaths. They're there because they grew up on the streets. They learned street behavior. And a lot of times that's illegal. And they didn't have the money to keep them out of jail. And and Kamala put them in prison. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So it goes back to the question. It goes back to the question, really, that it's like um, the banking system is seizing up again. Is this yes. going to be another um, 2007? And But this time, there's no return in your mind. Well, oh. Some notice, some don't. But in October of 2019, during the repo crisis, remember the repo crisis? I do. Yeah. At best, I can tell no one really understood that. That was a, a sort of spasmodic thing that was occurring that was no more understandable than a uh, than a lithium battery fire. I, I mean, yeah. it just it just started spazzing and. and 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 it becomes an emergent system, and emergent systems just don't follow a mathematical prediction, right? Right. And and but but right before that happened, BlackRock put out a white paper that said, "By the way, in the next crisis, you are not going to be able to solve it by bailing out the banks. You are going to have to go direct." That was the phrase they used. Go direct means you're going to have to jam copious amounts of capital into people's pockets because putting it in the banks, which saves them their, their reserve problem, right? So you take crappy assets off their books, you give them good assets, and now they're back. They're back into a legal world, despite the fact that they should have been, they, the banks should have, I think you have, you bail out the banks, but you have to make sure that everyone in the top echelon got wiped out. Everyone Jamie Dimon and a bunch of others got wiped out. You sh- Here's the deal. And, and Jamie Dimon was in the bank that didn't crash and burn, but I think it's just because Jamie Dimon happened to be in a bank that didn't crash and burn. He got paid by the bailout, right? He, he made right. a ton of money off the bailout. I, I would like to see some law that says um, that a banking CEO in the, t- in the C-suiters, I don't know how you define it. I'm not smart enough to. I'm not knowledgeable enough. But let's say there's, there's a definable top echelon of any mega bank that you can define in some mathematically sound way. The top 20 executive, top 20 highest paid guys, I don't care how you do it. Um, if your bank needs to be bailed out, you forfeit the last five years of all compensation. Um, for that. Right? And yep. that would cause the top 20 guys to say, whatever we do, we, can we get cannot bailed get bailed out. Because I'm not giving up that fucking yacht. Yep. And and that would solve the problem. Related theory I have, and I think this is out there, is that instead of giving out student loans to students, you should give tranches of, of, of put out tranches of debt for, say, Cornell. And, and then from those tranches, money is lent to students mm-hmm. and, and to go to college. And that the payback is not, that money, but rather a percent, a set per, a set percent of your annual salary for a set number of years. Not a set percent, a, 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 a set number of years, and let the free market determine the percent that they demand. 
for that tranche. Now, love that. right? So if MIT put out a, put out a tranche, if people would say, oh, I, I, I'll take a chunk of that. And every once in a while, you're going to hit a Zuckerberg or something. Although all yep. those guys quit college, but every once in a while, you're going to hit some guy. And, 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 and on the other hand, there are colleges where there's not a single kid in the whole school that w- would be a good investment. Right. And because of that, the percent that they would have to pay back makes it too oppressive to go to that school. And, and there you go, that school does not exist. That'd be great. Here's the problem. That will be considered racist. Right. Because, because you will be able to say, look, yeah, you know, white kids at Harvard, fine. Right. Right. And, and I mean, I don't know how many white kids are left at Harvard, but, but, but you know, you, yeah. you know what will happen. Yeah. And yeah. I think we'll see, I think we will see going forward far less kids feeling obligated to go to college. Yeah. I think we'll see far more kids going in towards training. I'd like to go back to an apprentice system. Yeah, I think go to an apprentice right. system. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and I think we'll see, um, I think kids are going to start picking their majors more carefully. Yeah. The peak of college, the apex, was Henry Blodgett's English major getting him rich on Wall Street. Right. That was the apex. Yeah. That was what? Uh, 2000, 2000. 2000. Yeah. 2000, yeah. Yeah. And. And and that was get a sheepskin, get rich, don't worry about it. Yeah. Um, so I think I don't know how to fix the current student debt problem, but 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 I, I think there's ways for the free market to deal with this shit. And one of I would really like to see the top echelon of the bankers lose all their compensation over the last five years. Now, third case related to this, people talk about debt jubilees. Well, debt jubilee. And I know it's, it sounds like I'm I'm told I'm a tangential thinker. Which means, you know, <laughs> hey, hey, there's a squirrel, uh, ADHD thing. I don't think I have ADHD, but I act like it. I, I play one on the internet. Um, is, um, oh, fuck, I just lost the stream of thought on that one. God, ju- damn it. Jubilee. Jubilee. Yeah. That Jubilee is from the past. They talk about, you know, Hammurabi or one of those guys, you know, uh, that, that Jubilee. Every seven years, wipe out the day. Yeah. But you can't have debt jubilees like that without telling them, look, there's going to be a debt jubilee in seven years. Right. So what happens is you say, oh, there's going to be a debt jubilee in seven years, which means, okay, I'll lend this guy this much money because he's good for it. and He'll get it back to me before seven years. Now we're two years from the jubilee. I'm not lending you shit. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and, and so, and so a more modern version of a debt jubilee could exist, but you have to tell, you can't have a debt jubilee where you just say, okay, all that money you owe, you don't owe anymore because there's a, you who my retirement has that money, that debt in it. You right. can't do that to me. Yeah. But I don't know how you deal with a trillion and a half student loans right now. Yeah. I don't think you can just forgive them. Yeah. I could no. live, I could live with a, you're going to pay a percentage of your salary for the next 20 years. It's an indentured servant. Well, it is. Oh, well, right. It's an indentured servant, but you, you took on the debt, but you're also 18 years old. Yeah. And the parents, if you're a parent out there, get rid of that guilt thing where you don't want to tell your kid where to go to school. I said to my son, I said, look, if you're smart enough to go to Cornell, I'll pay for it. If, if, if you're not, you're going to a safe school. Yeah. I told now, that they're to expensive kids. too. They're expensive too. And I said, look, I, I'm not paying you to go to Bennington College. I mean, it's just not going to happen. Yeah. By the way, right up the lake, Wells College in Aurora, New York, this idyllic little town, this small little college just went bankrupt. Yeah. They I went, there's it. about 55 colleges. We're actually a lot more bankrupt colleges. A yeah. Lot. And we should too. I mean, we they're should. just, we should. You know, why is a law degree a graduate degree? Why not just send a kid to college for four years and get a ma- major in law? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, well, listen, um, we got to land the plane here. <laughs> we talked a lot about it, different things. I guess there's uh, what you know. You will have enough gas to get to the crash site. <laughs> <laughs> Let's end with this. Um, what's 
do you expect anything crazy to happen? Or what's the crazy thing you expect to happen? The black swan between now and uh, December 31st, 2020. You mean, you mean besides assassinations and nuclear yeah. wars and the usual yeah. junk? Yeah. What's the one thing that well, you I, think has good odds of hitting? Well, I think the elections will be violent. Mm -hmm. And because I think what what is beyond a shadow of a doubt is the right will be poll watching their asses off. Yeah. They will be self-appointed poll watchers. And if someone closes the doors and locks poll watchers out and continues to vote, bricks will be thrown through those windows. Now, because of that, there will be violence instigated by the left to blame on the right. And so we're guaranteed to have violence on election night, I think. Yeah. Um, I think, um, I, I don't think Kamala can possibly win the election in a fair election. I think 2020 was rigged up the kazoo. I, I mean, I think 20, 2020 Kamala. was, uh, I, 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 I'd gladly bet even odds a million dollars that 2020 was rigged. Yeah. And rigged doesn't mean bias. The press, of course, biased the hell out of it. I mean, rigged as in the voting machines were screwed up. You know who owns Dominion? Soros? A, a company in Beijing. Well, there you go. I did. And, and what happened to, I went to see what happened when they settled for Tucker Carlson for Fox News for $700, $700 million. I said, oh, Dominion must have had a good boost to their share price today. I went to check it. They had been taken private in 2018. How convenient to go sort of off radar right. two years before the 2020 election. Yep. I did find their annual revenues. The Fox settlement, which went without a whimper, which a, a media company should fight for freedom of the press, right? They think? should fight to the death. Mm -hmm. um, settled without a whimper for $700 million plus change. And it turns out if you look at the revenues of Dominion, that was 10 times the net worth of the company. Interesting. Yeah, that, that seems a little egregious to me. Now, yeah, here's my prediction. Cool. Yeah. Dominion needed the win. The political system needed the win. I bet you no money changed hands. I bet you very little of that changed hands. And he said, let's fake a law settlement, a legal settlement. It's not like yeah. when the banks got fined $2 billion when you actually look, they say, by the way, if you donate money to this cause, we will cut it back to, 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 to 500 million. And by the way, it'll be tax deductible and therefore you'll end up paying nothing. Right. And right. so, the, the, so, so I think the 2020 election was completely rigged. I think 2016, they didn't know they had to rig it. Right. I think they thought they had it in the bag. They believed their own bullshit. 2024, I think will be hard to rig because I think Kamala if there's a hundred people in this world willing to vote for Kamala, it's scary that there's that many really stupid people. <laughs> and 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 if I understand why you hate Trump, I I really do understand how people hate Trump. I personally have grown my respect for Trump since in 2016 when I first pulled the lever with my hand shaking, going, "This is an experiment that I'm not comfortable with." Sure, I think Trump has weaponized narcissism and come to the conclusion he has to be a great president to be great. And yeah, I think so. with that, with that assassination thing, you know, all the shit he's been through, I think when he gets, if and when he gets to the White House, he will do a better job of trying to impose change that he only did lip service to in his first four years. Yeah. You want him to go after his enemies? One lobe says yes, one lobe says no. I would I would like to see some of the bad guys punished. Yeah. I would I would contribute. I would bring my Louisville slugger with me. Um <laughs> but but um but that's not necessarily the best outcome. So I, the other lobe should win that debate and say, look, just move on. Um yeah. My long-term prognosis, by the way, is 40 years from now, the market will be right where it is now, inflation adjusted. And that's not a wild prediction. That is based on the growth of the GDP assumed to be 
relatively invariant, which I think is a real reach to assume the next 40 years will be the same growth in GDP. I think that that would we'd be very lucky if we maintain that GDP growth. And and it just assumes that the market regresses to the mean through various ups and downs and ups and downs. But I think 40 years from now, you'll look up and you go, fuck, we haven't moved a buck. Now, I was just about to say, it means we haven't moved. Right. Now, I'll tell you, I've put out charts in my writing. If you take an inflation-adjusted S&P, you go back to 1906, you sit at the peak and you say, from that peak, when was the last time you returned to that price, hopefully never to return to it again? And the answer is 1981. 75 years later, you didn't wow. move a buck. 1929 gets the, the last time you get to the price of the 1929 peak. 1993, I think. Wow. People don't know that. I didn't know that. Take a look at an inflation adjusted down and just put a straight edge from the peaks across and say, it's not when you get your money back for the first time, it's when you get it back for the last time. Yeah. I look at uh, stocks you think of as doing well. I go, the Nikkei, right? The Nikkei has finally nominally got its money back. Now, we have a global recession. Is the Nikkei going to hold that? No. Right. No. And that was 44 years later, right? I think it's 30. <laughs> 35, 30, 35, 35, 89 to the president. Yes, you're right. You're right. You're right. I miscounted. I was thinking 1990. But, I but so, and, and it's not like Japan has rotted. It's still Japan. Yeah. It's still a, it's still a industrial first world country with smart people and a civilized society. Right. Not Ukraine. Right. And, and yet it, it, it's given up 35 years of treading water nominal. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So I think we're going to do that. I think we will do that off this high and I, we will not get a V bounce because the fed won't be able to do what it would like to do without triggering above the fold. We can't stand this anymore inflation. So the people who say, look, we're, we're, if you consider unfunded liabilities, the average taxpayer owes $2, two million of unfunded li Unfunded liabilities are liabilities that you've made promises you've made. So security. And then, you, okay. and then you project the revenue. The unfunded liabilities are the ones that you say, even with reasonable revenue coming forward, going to infinity, we don't know how to pay that off. That's, that's unfunded liabilities. Larry Kolokoff is the expert on that. $2 million per taxpayer. People say, well, we'll just inflate it away. I say, okay, you're right. So they're going to inflate away $2 million of your net worth. Mm -hmm. How is that better? <laughs> right? Interesting. It's the same thing, except it's for I'd thing. rather I'd rather give it up deflationarily. Yeah. You know, for one thing, I, I bet it's easier to defend against that. Yeah. Well, I think deflation is highly, deflation is highly underrated. <laughs> Very much so. You know, one of the reasons they can't have deflation is you can't tax it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if, if, you know, if your, if your gains are all decreased in stock price, capital gains will not exist. Of course, they'll just have been a wealth tax, which they're already putting into place anyway. So, yeah. um, along with the draft, you paying attention to that? Yeah, I have been. And I have uh, five kids. And European countries are also doing it. Yeah. So it's just endless wars. So in my so looking for trouble, I've written, profusely on why Putin is the good guy and we're the bad guys. That, 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 that's how to win friends and influence people. You know, um, I, um, I would love to dig, to dig into that more, but because I actually kind of agree with that, but I need more information. Well, you can read what I wrote. Yeah. I'd love to. <laughs> well, give that out. How can people get, uh, that are not familiar with your work? How can they find, and you're somewhat hard to find because of uh, you're in academia. But well, yeah, if I, you know my name and you know I'm a chemist, you know I'm at Cornell. If you can't find my email, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> um, <laughs> and 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 as I said, I talked to David Teich yesterday. I'm talking to a, a guy today who just did a podcast with Tom Nelson a couple of months ago on climate change. He he called me. I I, I do meet people this way. I've, 
I was, I had several very long conversations with Eric Weinstein. You got to get him on if you can. He's probably hard to get. I would love to. He's probably hard to get though. I He's would love very to. hard to get. But uh, talking to Eric is, is just a mind bending experience. He just, he has this way of thinking that's just, I haven't had a personal conversation with Brad. I digital only, but I'd love, I would pay good money to sit down with Brad for an afternoon and just chat. I have so many questions for Brad. Yeah. Because I, I was a genetics major, so I, I, it's evolutionary those biology. Those yeah. are my peeps. Yeah. Those, yeah those are so, your peeps. so in any event, so if you send your kid to college, don't waste your money. We look over their shoulders, <laughs> make sure. Yeah. If a kid takes a course in uh, gender studies, they just spent 10,000 bucks to find out how to be an activist. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and you, mom and dad just paid for that. Right. And so it can happen in my own soul. Not going right. to happen in my household either. <laughs> David, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much. For oh, I'm on Twitter. Me. David B. Column. David B. I Column. I will link to that. That's for all. David B. Column. That's, That's for all. Link. Uh, but just thank you so much for your time. I'd love to have you on again. And uh, I, we could go for a couple of hours next time. <laughs> yeah. 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 Sorry to hard stop you by being light. No, it's no problem. I got to run. Adios. Have fun. Thanks.